Think you know British cinema? Think again. Offbeat. British cinema's curiosities, obscurities, and forgotten gems. The Offbeat book, published by Head Press in 2013, is being given a makeover in a new expanded edition during 2022. My name is Daryl Buxton and I've been privileged to write for both versions. I'm a freelance film lecturer with a particular interest in cult movies and horror cinema and I'm also a regular member of the Cine Lit podcast team from Derby's multimedia venue Quad. In the original version of Offbeat, me and a few of the other contributors shared a few thoughts and reminiscences on one particular area of British film that had been rather forgotten or brushed under the carpet for years. A regular part of viewers' film-going experiences during the late 60s through the 70s to the early 80s meant that when you went to see a movie, be it the new Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds, Barbara Streisand or whoever, you paid for your ticket, you took your seat, and then, before the main attraction, you watched a British-produced short film. An often one whose subject matter or genre had little or no connection with the major feature. If you'd gone to see a Chuck Norris martial arts actioner, you might get a creepy half-hour mini horror movie alongside it. If you went to see a horror film, you'd probably get 20 minutes of daft comedy beforehand. And if you'd paid to have a laugh at the latest comedy hit, you might get 20 minutes of a rock concert, or a look at a big name music group recording their latest LP, and so on. I saw John Carpenter's The Thing in late 1982 at the ABC in Derby, preceded by a documentary about The Who's Face Dancers album, of all things, a prophetic title maybe, once the Carpenter film hit the screen and strange contortions did indeed begin to play upon the facial features of the hapless, alien-possessed snowbound cast in the main feature. If you asked the cinema patrons of the day about these support films, you'd almost certainly get an answer in the negative. Audiences never seem to learn about them somehow. I watched these theatrical programmes for many years, always aware that we were likely to see a short film, but always chuckling to myself when the house lights went down and the audience expectation rose. Finally, the film they'd paid to see, the film that they were waiting for, only to instead be confronted with a BBFC title card containing an unfamiliar name. If you'd paid to see Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm sure you didn't want to see the title Late Flowering Love pop up on screen. I'm sure a lot of punters thought that they'd wandered or been ushered into the wrong screen by mistake. Many viewers ignored these films or catcalled all the way through them, and often with good reason as the quality admittedly wasn't always high. A lot of the short films had been made merely in order to satisfy official quotas. For many years the law stated that British cinemas had to screen a certain percentage of British made material, and so if the cinema had booked Smokey and the Bandit, it also needed to play about half an hour of homegrown material too. So the short accompanying fare varied in length, usually anything between about 20 and 40 minutes. With the cancellation of the ED levy, and the rise of the multiplex where you might be encouraged to grab a coffee or a beer or even a full meal before or between films, the need for the shorts evaporated. This was a great shame in many ways as they had offered a good training ground for young actors and writers and sometimes even enabled fledgling directors to get to work with up and coming names or even with established stars. In recent times, short film production at a low budget and even amateur level has begun to thrive here in Britain as well as worldwide. New filmmaking technologies have encouraged lots of people to have a go, and it's pretty easy to shoot a 5 or 10 minute film on your phone and edit it on your laptop these days. 
YouTube and other platforms are positively crying out for you to do just that. And I think that the rise in 21st century short film production has caused a few experts in the field, a handful of researchers into our film history and legacy, to look back with an increased fondness on the supporting fair of yesteryear. In 2019, I published a monograph entitled Short Sharp Shocks, attempting to capture the history of the British short film in an appropriately concise 20,000 words, with an emphasis on the macabre, sinister, violent or spooky fair from the late Victorian era right up to today, but with a big focus on the supporting films that I remembered seeing in my late teens and early twenties during the closing days of the old A, AA and X certificate system. Some of the films that I covered in my booklet included early work by the likes of Tony Scott and Alan Parker, such as the former's American Civil War drama One of the Missing, based on the Ambrose Bierce story, or Parker's Hitchcockian thriller set in a rooming house, Footsteps. Michael Armstrong's haunting 1967 film Images with its ghostly figure played by an aspiring pop star named David Bowie, popping up all over the place to terrify a portrait painter. I included several films by James Dearden, who later became world-renowned via his script for Fatal Attraction. Before he got into adultery and bunny-boiling, James had made the contraption with Rocky Horror's Richard O'Brien building some kind of mysterious device out of wood and metal, all leading to a typical surprise, or in this case, snap, ending. There was Dearden's Panic, one of the very best remembered shorts, a terrifying excursion onto our suburban roads at the dead of night, with a lone female driver stopping to pick up a drenched old lady in a rainstorm and soon regretting her act of kindness. And Dearden also offered diversions, a 45-minute film about an adulterous affair which he later developed into his lucrative aforementioned Hollywood meal ticket. The short was a perfect form for depicting young women being pursued by stalkers in car parks, public swimming pools and even their own homes in the respective likes of Dead End, Dark Water and The Dumb Waiter. The ladies occasionally turned the tables, as in Alan Blake's superb 1979 film Victims, where a neurotic housewife who can't tell fantasy from reality stabs the milkman and then kills her boring white-collar worker husband. The British Film Institute have also used the title Short Sharp Shocks in the past couple of years, not in print, but as the banner for their most welcome Blu-ray collections which have revived some of these great programme fillers and brought them to a viewership who may recall seeing them with Jaws 2 or The Empire Strikes Back or may be experiencing them for the first time. If you want to find out more, pick up the BFI Blu-rays, take a look at my essay which includes a substantial guide to how you can see well over 200 of these films on YouTube or elsewhere online or as DVD and Blu-ray extras on a variety of discs. Or indeed read Offbeat where the likes of myself, David Hyman and Kim Newman dredge up our memories of sitting in flea pit cinemas for half an hour before the main film and occasionally finding a little nugget of cinematic treasure. Head Press. Publishing the books you love. Find us at headpress.com. Think you know British cinema? Think again. Offbeat. British cinema's curiosities, obscurities, and forgotten gems. Hi. I'm Sarah Morgan and I'm one of the contributors to Offbeat and I'm going to speak a little bit about one of the films I've written about for the book which is The Block House from 1973 directed by Clive Rees. He also co-wrote the screenplay with John Gould 
and it was based on former French Resistance member Jean-Paul Kleber's 1955 novel. Incidentally, the book is said to have been inspired by a true story involving a couple of guys who themselves were trapped in a bunker um, for a couple of years after World War II, eventually being freed, and sadly, they both died. Um, for Reese, this was his debut film, and strangely, he doesn't seem to have done an awful lot after it. If the if his credits on the AMDB and the BFI website are anything to go by, anyway, he's done. He did some TV work, and then he didn't actually make another big screen film until 1989, which was when the whales came. And his last credit was 1998's Living with the Lions. Uh, which he produced rather than directed. I say strangely because if the blockhouse is anything to go by, I can't say that I've seen any other examples of his work, um, he was really rather gifted. He certainly has a great eye for a, an image. Some of, the, some of the scenes inside the actual blockhouse are beautifully put together, beautifully composed. Um, and it does make you wonder why he couldn't perhaps use this as a calling card um, to get himself other work. Anyway, the film itself more or less disappeared. It never received a general release in the UK, even though it had the, the leading man, or among a sort of ensemble cast, if you like, is Peter Sellers. Now, looking back at Sellers' career, you would think any film that he was in would be worth a general release in this country because he, even now, 42 years after his death, um, he's still regarded as a big star. But at the time, his career was going through a bit of a slump, to say the least. In fact, in 1973, he released three films, the other two being Ghost in the Noonday Sun and The Optimist of Nine Elms, um, and all three flopped, more or less disappeared without trace. The now Ghost in the Noonday Sun, at any rate, is now better known for being a pretty disastrous shoot. Um, and Spike Milligan later commented that during this period, um, it, well, he described it as Sellers' period of indifference, uh, in which his career might have fizzled out completely. However, I'd suggest that actually during this time and a little bit before it, Sellers actually made some of his most interesting work. I mean, I, I obviously you think back now and you think of stuff like the Pink Panther films and uh, the work he did with Stanley Kubrick and um, being there as probably his, his best films, or certainly his best regarded films, um, and maybe the Bolton Brothers film, I'm All Right, Jack, for which he won a BAFTA. And I wouldn't disagree with that in some ways, but what I find more interesting are the films that seem to have not relied on his, his kind of ability to mimic um, and his sort of comedic capabilities. Things like Hoffman, where he has to be more, more of an ordinary person, if you like. And similarly with The Blockhouse, he's playing... Um, a, a man who was a, a school teacher in everyday life before World War Two started. Um, when we first see him, he's, his character's called Rocky. He's um, part of a sort of forced labour group, um, and they're in, they're imprisoned by the Germans. Um, and the opening scenes of the film are quite spectacular. Actually, it's some sort of allied attack on a German base and the guys from the forced labour camp, a group of them, hurry for cover in this blockhouse. Uh, but then the bombs come down and they end up being trapped inside and the rest of the film is them coping with the captivity. They think at first they're going to be fine because the blockhouse itself is full of supplies. So they've got, they've got candles, so they've got light. There's... Uh, booze down there so they've got something to drink there's loads of food so they've got something to eat but then as time goes on uh, it becomes increasingly clear that nobody is coming to rescue them so the film itself is kind of how they cope with that um and uh, not well 
is uh, is the outshot of it really. But Sellers, he is just part of the ensemble. Um, there are quite a few other sort of very familiar faces in the film. People like Charles Aznavour, Jeremy Kemp, Peter Vaughan, uh, Leon Lissick, uh, Alfred Lynch. They're all part of this group who, um, and they all sort of have equal, equal screen time, really. And it's how the men are, are interacting with each other. So Sellers isn't doing the big, uh, hey, look at me kind of a performance. He's, he's very low key, very kind of, he, he is just playing the part as you would imagine this character to be a quiet country school teacher doing his best to cope in a really hideous situation. He does have a French accent, but if you're thinking Inspector Clouseau, then you're going to be wide, wider than Mark. It's a genuine French accent, or to my um, untrained ears, it feel it feels right. It's not overblown. Um, we're not laughing at, at the way he pronounces things. It, there's nothing like that. It's it's a very well observed performance. Um, the big mystery to me is why Sellers took the role in the first place, because quite often he seems to have been motivated by money um, and motivated by fame. So he would take roles which in films which didn't turn out very well, but there was a big pay packet. So some of the stuff he made in Hollywood in the late 60s it's not just that it hasn't aged well, it's just that it's not very good. You know, I'm thinking about things like what's new Pussycat. Um, so why he took the blockhouse is a bit of a mystery. I seem to remember reading somewhere that his wife at the time, wife number three of the model Miranda Quarry, had liked the script and encouraged him to do it. Now, there are stories as well that he, that Sellers seemed quite down at times on the set of the blockhouse and the, it's sort of assumed that it's because his marriage to quarry was in a little bit of disarray it was it was on the verge of collapse so did he take it because he th he thought it was a way to make her happy or you know a way to sort of show that he, res he respected her decisions i'm i'm not sure about that he doesn't seem to have been the kind of person that particularly was bothered about that kind of thing but who knows he, he, he was a an odd character to say the least in his own right so maybe he just felt he, he wanted to do something different whatever the reason I'm glad that he did it because it is a like I say it is a really really great performance but the performances of everybody are, are good maybe that's another thing that inspired him he could see that the rest of the actors were producing their best work, so he had to raise his game. He couldn't rely on the faces and the voices anymore. I first became aware of the blockhouse while I was reading Roger Lewis's excellent biography, The Life and Death of Peter Sellers. I found Sellers as a person so utterly compelling and fascinating that I became slightly obsessed with tracking down some of his films, some especially the obscure ones like The Blockhouse. Um, and I, I wasn't I wasn't disappointed when I finally got to see it. Um, it's not easy viewing. I can't say that you know you're going to get to the end credits and think, "Wow," and be you know overjo over overjoyed by what you've seen. You're not. You're going to be. You're going to be quite depressed, frankly. It's a dark, claustrophobic tale. Um, but what you are going to find is that you you re you are rewarded by great acting and and camera work. The scenes inside the bunker are just lit beautifully. All sort of, they're all done by candlelight. It's all quite naturalistic. Um, quite often, it's just faces on the screen. I'm actually watching the film as I'm speaking to you, um, and it is it is quite an astonishing piece of work. It, on a 
it would seem like an actor's delight as well, having actual real characters to play. Um, but apparently the conditions actually got some of them down, Jeremy Kemp in particular. Roger Lewis quotes Clive Reese as saying that um, Kemp almost had a nervous breakdown on set because he couldn't he couldn't stand the um, the conditions at all because it was filmed actually filmed in a real bunker on Guernsey. What's also notable is that um, Sellers is now well known for his his antics on set, as in not being able to behave himself. Um, he quite often fell out with directors. Even directors like Blake Edwards that he supposedly got along with and, and produced good work with, he would he would fall out with them um, on Ghost of the Noonday Sun. Um, he played up for Peter Medak. Um, other members of the crew have mentioned that he just didn't turn up on some days. They'd be waiting for him and he played the star, the diva, and disappeared. But during the blockhouse, he, has, he, he did seem to stick to what he was meant to do um, and Reese was really impressed with his ability to move in and out of character he'd be telling jokes between takes to keep everybody entertained and then but as soon as the cameras rolled he would be deadly serious he'd be totally in character as Rook A. Um, I think as well if if this was the only film that you'd ever seen him in or, or the first film that you'd ever seen Sellers in you would assume that he was sort of a classically trained stage actor, um, a, a character actor, rather than, uh, you know, an A-list movie star or a comedian. But, yeah, the film vanished without a trace, without really ever getting a proper release anyway. Um, it seems as if the production company had expected a, a Peter Sellers vehicle, but what they got was a deadly serious drama, a character study. Um, unfortunately as well, it didn't boost Sellers' career as a as a dramatic actor. Um, some more flops followed it, uh, and, and he ended up, in 1975, returning to Blake Edwards, and together they made The Return of the Pink Panther. It kind of was his default setting, really, once... You know, if he, if some of his films didn't go well, then he would think, or seem to think, I know, I'll get things back on track, I'll make another Pink Panther, it'll be a success at the box office, then I can go on and do more or less as I want. Um, which did sort of work up to a point. Um, but unfortunately, the sort of last few years of his career didn't, they, they kind of fizzled out a little bit, really. It did make being there, which I, personally think he should have won the Oscar for that year, although he missed out to um, Dustin Hoffman in Kramer vs. Kramer. But apart from that, there's, there's an awful lot of instantly forgettable films, which is a little bit sad, really, because he, Sellers really was hugely talented. It, it seems an obvious thing to say, but in to my mind, he never really fulfilled his potential in, in some respects. There are flashes of genius here and there um, in some of the films I've already mentioned, like I'm All Right, Jack, and uh, maybe the first two Pink Panthers, Doctor Strangelove certainly, and certainly being there, and I would add The Blockhouse to that list. As for The Blockhouse now, um, it has been sort of a little bit critically reassessed. Um, and it's also, since since I wrote the piece in the book, it's had a nice shiny uh, Blu-ray release, um, which is full of, of special features, interviews with uh, people associated with the film and whatnot. And that, I suspect, uh, would be something that Sellers himself would have appreciated. He was a massive fan of gadgets and technology. So to be able to watch his own films on his own TV um, and hear people that he knew talking about them it might have been something that he'd have, he'd have enjoyed. But sadly, we'll never know. Anyway, that's my assessment of The Blockhouse. Hope you liked it. Bye!
Head Press. Publishing the books you love. Find us at headpress.com.